Good evening. I'm Dick Gooding, and uh, I'm your host for this evening's uh, uh, edition of Veterans Remember. Uh, Veterans Remember is a uh, series uh, sponsored by and produced by HCAM, where Hopkins veterans are given the opportunity to tell us a little bit about their stories. And some of them are very fascinating. We have veterans from the World War II era, we have veterans from Korea and Vietnam, and up to the present day veterans. And uh, we look forward to uh, presenting to you uh, his historical background of uh, what some of our veterans here in Hopkinton have done. And uh, tonight, uh, joining me is John Cahill, a uh, close friend of mine and uh, 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 fellow Hopkinton High School football uh, viewer on Friday nights. And uh, John is going to uh, tell us a little bit about things that he has done, uh, both as a, as a youth growing up, uh, going into the, the service, and a little bit about his service. Uh, first of all, John, uh, tell us about your family and where you grew up. I grew up on a little, at 11 C Street, where I live now. And I was born in that house. And uh, my mother was a midwife. And she got $5 for delivering a child. And the doctor came and got $10 for filling out the official paper. That, and my father was working as a painter in a paper hanger when there was work. This was during the 30s. And I can remember quite often, things were bad. Uh, we had plenty to eat. But there was somebody new and different sleeping on the couch every morning when I came down. Somebody came by and stopped and got a meal, and they put them up for the night. This is during the Depression, is this that is correct? This is during the 30s. Wow. And that's when I was going to school in the 30s and the early 40s. Mm -hmm. Well, things started getting better in 40, 41. Everybody could get a job, but wanted one. So consequently, we had a volunteer fire department, and there weren't any firemen in town. So the senior boys in high school, and the fire alarm rang, we all went to the fire. And now, where was the, the high school was uh, right high next door to us? High school was on Main right, Street. Right next door to us now. Yeah, two, two, two doors up. Yeah. And, and the fire station is, so was where what? Where Kalolos is? No, now? the fire station is right where, right where, uh, where the, the new fire one is. station is now, but it was only a two door fire station. A two door fire station. Yes. <laughs> but well, so tell us about, uh, so the high school kids were really the ones who would jump on the, uh, yeah, on the they, fire there engine? there wasn't anybody else. And, and high school kids drove it and put the fires out or made them worse, whatever happened. <laughs> now, when did you graduate from high school here I, in Hopkins? I graduated in 43. 1943. And uh, the last two years, uh, I was junior and senior, at, they used to have a 12 o'clock whistle at the fire station. Mm -hmm. And I'd get up out of my class at 10 minutes to 12 and walk down the fire station and blow the whistle. <laughs> oh, you were the one that blew the whistle? Yeah. Is that right? Huh. Uh, now, what caused, uh, when you graduated from high school, how soon after that did you go in the service? I graduated in June and then I went in right away and they told me to come back out here and get some papers signed by the chief of police saying I was a, a good citizen. Well, the chief of police was Edward McManus and he and I never got along because of all the trouble I caused him. Oh, really? Tell yeah. us a little bit about that. What kind of trouble did you cause? <laughs> no, I'm not going to go into that. <laughs> but anyway, one of the things we did when we were kids, there was a First National right next to the town hall. Right. And there was an A.M.P. on the corner of Walcott Street. Right. And in front of the A.M.P. they had a, a, a display of their fruits. And we'd go by the and steal fruit. <laughs> <laughs> Grab an apple, huh? Or oh, whatever was out there. <laughs> and 
So, so did so did Chief McManus sign your? Uh, well, he was he was working up in the thread mill at that. He got three hundred dollars a year for his job, and because anything happened, he came to my house first because he. he oh, oh, you mean you had that kind of a reputation? <laughs> yeah, huh? I had that. <laughs> well, it was easy to get to if you're just on C yeah. Street, right? And, uh, I was taller than most of the kids that I hung around with. I was the ringleader, according to him. But anyway, when I went up to his, his house in the evening, he said he wouldn't sign the papers. So I'm coming down Grove Street, and I'm crying. I wanted to go in the Marine Corps real bad. And right in front of the old car barn was a bench, and there was a lot of retired people sitting on there. And there was one gentleman in a black suit with a derby hat, and he said, Jack, what's the matter? I told him, your son wouldn't sign my papers. He said, well, my name is Edward V. McManus. He said, I'll sign them. <laughs> this so, is Ed's father. Yeah. So the next morning, I called Johnny Thayer. He had a Thayer's Express truck. Right. And I said, Johnny, I need a ride into Boston. So come up and get in the back of the truck, and I rode in. I went in the, I think it was the federal building, and give my papers, and they says, here, here's a ticket. Go to Washington, D.C., Union Station. Now, I'd never been anywhere out of Hopkins before. I went to Boston a few times to see the Braves, and I've been to New York City once. <laughs> but <laughs> that was the beginning of that. Wow. A big adventure for me. And, and did Ed McManus ever uh, catch up to you and uh, ask oh, you Oh, no. Sign Afterwards, that? he came over and shook my hand and thanked me for my <laughs> service. <laughs> and don't get in any more trouble. <laughs> well, gee, Ed, Ed must have been the... He must have been the chief for a long time. He was. Because I think he was chief when I f first moved yeah. to town in 51. Well, we had a change of uh, selectmen, and we put, they put in Jackie Holdridge. <laughs> yeah, after that, right. Well, so, t so tell me about, uh, uh, about your trip into uh, uh, Union Station and well, heading that was, that was great. Um, we, uh, I had a Pullman car, and it was uh, something I never had before. And mm -hmm. Time went by fast, and I got to Union Station in Washington, and I met a group there, and we had a 12-hour layover, so we did some of the s sites around Washington. Were there other people from Hopkinton that were on the... Not at that particular not at time. That time. No, I went by myself. And what year was this? 43? Hmm? This was 1943? 1943, yeah. yeah. And one of the things I did, I, I climbed the Washington Monument. Did you? Yeah, that's, I couldn't do it now, but... <laughs> and not many of us could, I think, right now. Yeah. But anyway, we finally got down to... Paris Island, South Carolina, and I was astonished when I come through through the Salton Sea, colored drinking fountains and white drinking fountains. I never saw anything like that. Right. And when I got, it was night when we got down, I think with Port Royal, mm -hmm. and they put us on a barge and took us out to Paris Island because there wasn't a causeway then. And it's midnight when you get there, and <laughs> all these big guys. Uh, screaming at us and yeah. calling us all kinds of names and yeah. pushing us around. That was when they could punch you in the face if, if you got out of line. Well, you didn't get out of line, I'm no, sure. I tried not to. <laughs> <laughs> well, when, uh, so... Uh, and then they gave us... They had us stand on these yellow footprints. Mm -hmm. And they got us straightened out into a group. And we didn't march, we just staggered around. <laughs> and we went into, I must have been a medical center, and they checked us again for our health, took all our clothes away, and then we went in, and the guy who was across the county handed you, this is going to fit you, this is what you're going to wear. And by that time, it was almost breakfast time. Yeah. And we had breakfast, and then we got a haircut, and they were right ballsy. Get you right down to your yeah. right down to the skin, huh? Yeah, everybody looked the same, even yeah. the guys that were zoop suits. Yeah. <laughs> well, you must have done well at uh, at basic. And, oh, uh, that was easy yeah. for me. So, where did you go after you after you completed basic? Well, 
they gave me a 10-day furlough when I mm -hmm. came back to Hopkins, and, um, and then I, from there I had to go to North Carolina, Camp Lejeune. Oh, when I got to Camp Lejeune, they had, they had no barracks, all they had was cell holes. The only thing they had built then was, uh, they had the brig, and they had the um, um, chapel. Mm -hmm. So we were sleeping in pup tents, and that particular time, we had six or eight inches of snow down there, and I thought South North Carolina was going to be warm. Yeah. South Carolina was warm in August. <laughs> yeah, I'll bet it was. Yeah. So uh, when did you go overseas from... Uh, um, from there, we uh, we left in, uh, in January, I think it was, and we had a train trip across the United States to Camp Pendleton, which is in Oceanside, California. Right. And we, I spent uh, on, on training there, and um, in the month, I guess it was, it must have been the month of June, Roosevelt came out there, and um, he picked the regiment I was with to go to Guam for a, a reserve officer because they were having a hard time. Mm -hmm. There were two uh, generals, a Marine Corps general named Smith and an Army general named Smith, and they both had the same time in, and they were both arguing over who was going to be running <laughs> things, and the chaps were pushing people back. Well, I'm sure the Marine must have won that argument. I say that well, as an Army guy. I don't know whether they did or not. I'm not sure. <laughs> well, here's a picture for the, you folks to take a look at of, uh, of our hero, John, uh, as a uh, proud Marine. So, John, after uh, uh, well, you went to, you went to Guam? Didn't, we didn't get to Guam. Oh, we got about didn't. halfway, and they decided they didn't need us. I see. So they, we went back to our, what going to be the future rest camp for the 5th Division was on the uh, big island of Hawaii. Mm -hmm. Well, we landed in Hilo, and they put us in these uh, cattle cars on a railroad, took us from Hilo around the volcanoes up to the desert side of the island. And when we got there, there was a remnants of a camp, and we had to build it up for pyramid tents mm -hmm. and dig new uh, outhouses, oh, latrines, right? whatever. Yeah. They had. And uh, there was a lot of work. And uh, eventually, the rest of the, we, we were the 26th, the 27th and 28th arrived. But they all got 30 days leave before going overseas. We missed that. You missed that one. Yeah. Huh? yeah. But they paid me for all the leave I didn't get when I got out. Well, we kept training on Hawaii. We were, had one problem there, as a, a regimental one, and we were blank ammunition. Well, we had a lot of guys that had been in the paramarines and the Marine Raiders, and they had already spent 30, uh, 30, uh, three years overseas. And they came back to the States, and they got a 30-day leave, and then he shipped them back overseas, and they uh -huh. were not happy. Well, somebody had live ammunition, and they shot an officer in, in the arm. Oh, jeez. So. Sure, you guys picking on the officers again, huh? Oh, uh, all the time. <laughs> so the, the next day, they're going to rerun the whole thing. Well, the next day, apparently where we were had been a, a mortar range, mm -hmm. and somebody stepped on a dud mortar, and it blew up, and three more people were injured. Oh, boy. So they had them. Um, and this is in Hawaii. You haven't even this got is to in work. Hawaii, You yeah. haven't even got to fight yet. <laughs> I know. So then uh, they announced in the mess hall they had um, a major from, I don't know, CID? Mm-hmm. Yeah, whatever that was. And he's going to have the name of the person that committed that act. I see. Well, we're all waiting for him and waiting. He didn't show. So they went over to the tent where we were sleeping. He was still sleeping, but he had a piano wire around his neck. Somebody had killed him during the oh, night. Oh, jeez. Well, that's why I'm telling you. Those guys in it's there. It's a tough group. They were rough. So they let the whole thing slide. Oh, jeez. 
<laughs> they didn't want to send another uh, CID officer over there. No. They're afraid of, afraid of all you guys. But when we, when we first got there, in the, I was in an engineer company. Mm -hmm. Sizer Major came out in the morning and said, we're short of all kinds of supplies, he said. So the best you can have, you and each one of you will get 11 sheets of toilet paper a day. 11 a day? <laughs> 11 a day. <laughs> now this is a, uh, uh, a general rated uh, show tonight, so I, I don't think we really want to go any further with the uh, 11 pieces of toilet paper. Well, uh, you you uh, spent some time in Iwo Jima? Yeah, I spent 42 days there. Why don't you tell us a little bit about I will uh, indeed. Well, that. it was a long ride to begin with. It took 45 days to get there by an, uh, a, a troop ship. And you were probably hoping it would be another 45 days, right? <laughs> no, I was trying to get off. Oh, okay. I was seasick. <laughs> and and uh, it was um, a cloudy, rainy day. The, the um, 27th and 28th Marines uh, landed abreast. The 28th was towards Sarabachi, the mountain. Mm -hmm. They were to take that. And the 27th was to take the airstrip. And Mount Sarabachi is the yeah. famous picture yeah. that and all of us see. Maybe we'll have an opportunity to flash that up for uh, the folks as well. But I was in the third wave, and it, uh, it was just misting. It wasn't, it wasn't bad. And this is the first time uh, I ever made a landing where the landing craft came right in the shore and put the front down on the sand. So we're walking up a hill. There's, um, in a single file, I'm about, about four feet apart. And I was behind the, the we had a, 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 a squad leader, a sergeant. His name was uh, Gayhawk, uh, Gaylord Mihawk. He was an Apache Indian, and he was an old man when we were kids. Well, <laughs> We just about got up to the top of the hill and a mortar shell landed in the stomach and blew him up. And oh. blew him all over me and I've got his blood running all over me and I used to <laughs> wounded but I wasn't. But the two kids behind me were. So I got them back to the aid station on the shore and they were lucky they got them on, right out to a hospital ship. Because just about then a storm hit and everything coming in supplies and everything and boats were broaching and tipping over. So it was getting dark and uh, the um, <coughs> airstrip was probably eight feet above where I was and it had a banking coming down on an angle and I dug under it and they, we were shelled from both sides all night long. Mm. Well, that hole I made was three feet deep to start with, when it was done, it was close to six feet. <laughs> I'm sure. Well, the guy I was with was named Van Orden. He's from New Jersey, and he told me, he was older than I was. He was probably in his 30s. He said, I'm not going to fight. I said, well, they'll shoot you. So he said, I'm not. So next morning, all our NCOs and the colonel and all the officers got together in a big shell hole, and the Japs dropped the shell in on them, killed them all. So we're without major NCOs, and so they start making <laughs> squad leaders out of PFCs. And if there were any corporals or sergeants left, they went up in rank. But it's like. I was an uh, acting sergeant. You don't get any more money, <laughs> but huh. you're still in charge. You try to make things work. But that's the way, it, I think if that's what any American outfit, if the leaders get killed, whoever's left takes over. That's right. Oh. Now you were on a, a demolition? Uh, I was demolition a demolition expert. And the um, first two days I was there, I was a stretcher bearer. And after the, I think after the third day, all the infantry were dead. That they brought, and so everybody else moved up. I became a infantry. I was a, they put me in with I Company 26 Marine. And I'm talking to a guy, and I said, hey, "You've been with them long?" He said, "No, I came yesterday. I'm a baker." 
I was a baker. But everybody in the Marine Corps was a, a sure. basically a, a rifleman. It's an infantryman and for sure. It was just like World War One. If it took 50 feet, 50 yards a day, you were lucky. And how many days were you uh, at Iwo Jima? It took me 42 days to go. The guys on the right, which was Bobby Lavoy on the on the on the fourth division, on Bobby right Lavoy from Hopkins. Yeah. yeah, there was five guys from Hopkins. Right. Bobby Lavoy and Harold Bowman were in the uh, fourth division, mm -hmm. and they were on the right flank. Mm -hmm. And Dick Claflin was in the third division. He was in the center, and I was in the left flank, and uh, and. The right flank <coughs> on the island only went up for a shot. Well, they got out in 38 days. And the center, when the 5th and the 4th came together, the this, this 3rd Division moved back. Well, it, it was mostly, it was a lot of hand-to-hand -hand fighting. And, and when you kill somebody up close, the blood gets all over you. There's, there's no way about it. And, of course, when the blood dries, it's black and the flies come. In fact, what they did, they had, a, uh, I think, a DC-3 fly over the island and put DDT over everything. Mm. But now, uh, you mentioned a, uh, a couple mm -hmm. guys from Hopkins, and uh, Paul Phipps was over there at the same Paul time. Paul Phipps was Tell way behind it. He was a guard for the commanding general. Oh, I see. So he wasn't, he wasn't up there uh, getting flies all no, over. No, he wasn't. No. And the other <laughs> thing that used to bother me a lot, after you, you fought all day to get 50, 100 yards, you're running out of ammunition, you're running out of water. You, nobody brings any up because it's getting dark. Nobody comes up in the dark. In fact, when I was a uh, stretcher bearer, they asked me if I'd bring two. Uh, second lieutenants up to the line. I said, they don't want to do that at night. We only got about halfway there, and they started shooting us from two sure. different directions. Yeah. From the Marine Corps and from the Japs on the flank. Wow. John, after you left Iwo Jima, uh, uh, where did you go from there? Um, the ship I went over on had 3,000 guys, mm -hmm. and the ship I come back on was the same one. It was 500 guys. And really? The rest were there casualties was, of um, some sort. A lot of uh, wounded on our ship, but no doctors. They had corpsmen. Another thing, in the 42 days over there, we lost 13 corpsmen. And we lost five, yeah, five um, platoon leaders, uh, mostly second lieutenant. And the last one we got was a guy right out of Quantico. And he came up. And he, he says, I'm looking for three other guys to know how to play bridge, and the rest of you do what you've been doing, you're doing a fine job. Hmm. So we had another 50 yards to go to, to reach the ocean. <laughs> it was down a gully, and they had the high ground on both sides. And I said, what the hell are we going to do this for? And who comes up but General Geiger? He was a little short, fat guy, and he said, we got to go down there. So, I, being a smart ass, you lead General Will Fall. He went, <laughs> we went, and we lost two more guys. <laughs> oh, jeez. So, uh, when you left Iwo Jima? Uh, oh, we came, we, um, we came back to Hawaii, but on the way back uh, in the convoy, we were at uh, 11 o'clock in the morning, they had all shipped to return one way and they buried the dead. And that, that really made an impression mm. on me. Mm. And everybody <laughs> hope we don't get appendicitis because there's yeah. nobody here to take care of us. Yeah. Hmm. So, so uh, when oh, you came we back to back Hawaii... Hmm? Y yeah, you to the same place. I see. And uh, then uh, we all got back then. Well, gee, there'll be a lot of rates because we don't have any NCOs. So we get back there, and there's all kinds of sergeants and, and platoon sergeants and gunny sergeants that have been doing guard duty in the States. Yeah. And we the same thing. And, uh, but oh. we trained some more and trained some more. 
Well, you had the new guys coming in. You, to, you have to kind of have, it's like practicing in football. Yeah. I mean, football and combat are a lot alike. Yeah. Well, listen, John, we really have enjoyed uh, you telling us about, about what led up to you joining the, the service, the Marines, and certainly your experience at Iwo Jima. Uh, it's, uh, it's something that many of us have read about and very few of us have had the opportunity to I was experience. very lucky because we were on our way board, and we were on board ship and heading for Japan to invade Japan at Kyushu. Mm -hmm. And they dropped the bombs and the war was over. Wow. So then again, the Marine Corps gave me the business. They kept all us young guys and gave us six months extended duty in Japan doing <laughs> everybody as older went home. As a, Which, a, a, as a war of, or an occupation. army of occupation. Yeah. yeah, I see. Well, I want to thank you very much, and, and I know our audience uh, of uh, veterans remember. Uh, thank you as well. And uh, we're very appreciative of your service and uh, appreciate you sharing your stories with us this evening. You found the channel and you've watched the shows. Now, find out how the magic happens on Inside H Cam. The host, but get ready to truck right and give me some shots with both of them. Burl, at 15 minutes in, we need to cue them for a 60 second break. Got it. Thanks. You want one of these? Send me an email. I'll pull a few names out of a hat. Finally, I keep them. <laughs> Thank you. I don't get it.